Hey Bobby, guess what? Oh, hi Mark. This boss fight against Aryan Road in Trails to Azure is kicking my ass. Can you help me out here? Sure, dude. Fulbright. Prosecutor. Blackwell. Who the hell is this guy? He's my boss. I mean, I'm his boss. Since he's a convicted murderer, I mean, you know what? It's complicated. He's a freaking what? Are you playing video games without me? Fulbright. No, of course not, Prosecutor Blackwell. I just thought you wouldn't enjoy the series that we're playing. Imbecile. I enjoy all video games. Okay, but the series we're playing is like hundreds of hours long. You really got that kind of time? Bitch, I'm literally a prison inmate. I got all the time in the world. Point taken. If you really want to get into trails, I won't stop you. Seriously, Prosecutor Blackwell, it's amazing. Quit dawdling and show me what trails game I should play first. Of course, sir. It all begins with incest. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Wait, wait, wait. Come back, Prosecutor Blackwell. My name? I'm Bobby Fulbright. In justice we trust. Trails Through Daybreak, the 11th installment of the Trails series, were released on July 5th, 2024. So naturally, longtime Trails fans, including myself, are very excited to see where the story goes beyond the most recent game, Trails Into Reverie. However, if you are a newcomer and are interested in Daybreak, but haven't played the previous games, you will most certainly not be able to appreciate it to its fullest extent. That is why my goal of this video is to hopefully catch newcomers up to speed on the story. This will be a hefty task, as the lore throughout Trails is surprisingly dense, and I wouldn't be surprised if this video exceeds 2 hours, but I'll do my best. Of course, I will always recommend people to play the previous games instead of watching a recap video like this, because it is in my opinion that you should always experience a story for yourself. However, I do understand that everyone has that kind of time. If you look up these games on howlongthebeatit.com, it'll list all the games around the 50 to 100 hour mark. So if you don't want to spend literally a thousand hours worth of RPGs, this video is for you. These games are amazing, don't get me wrong, but I do also realize that there are people out there with social lives. <laughs> And for those who have already played the games, you can also use this as a refresher. Now this shouldn't come as a surprise, but this video will contain spoilers for every single game in the series before daybreak. I will also briefly touch upon the spin-off game, The Legend of Nayuta Boundless Trails, at the end of this video. But whether that game is canon or not is up to debate. Alrighty then, let's get started! Before I begin, it's important to establish the major locations of the series. The story of Trails takes place on the continent of Zamermia, where each of the different games take place on the many different countries within the continent. The Kingdom of Liberal, the Empire of Arabonia, the Trade City of Crossbell, the Republic of Calvard, the Principality of North Ambria, Jirai Special Economic Zone, Lemon State, Ored State, the Nord Highlands, the Principality of Romaferia, and finally, the Holy City of Arteria. I'll go over the history of each of these different locations over the course of this video. Our story truly begins in the ancient past. One day, a goddess known as Adios appeared on the land. She bestowed the Sumerian civilization, at the time, seven relics known as the Seven Septarians, each capable of granting miracles to humanity. Or to be more precise, 
they have the ability to grant wishes. Each Septarian represented one of the seven elements of the world. Fire, Earth, Water, Wind, Space, Mirage, and Time. She also granted each Septarian a holy beast to protect it. I'll cover each of them one by one. The Septarian of Fire, a massive titan known as the Arc Rouge, was given and worshipped to a group known as the Witches. Its guardian is a beast known as Rosella, who later became the Elder of the Witches. The Septarian of Earth, known as the Last Sem, and was also a massive titan, is worshipped by a group known as the Gnomes, and its leader, Black Alberic. Its guardian holy beast is a unicorn named Argus. The Septarian of Space, a ring known as the Ariel, the Ariel, the Ariel, the Ariel, the Ariel, I'm screwed, I'm just going to call it the Oreo. <laughs> the Septarian of Space, a ring known as the Oreo, was given to Celestis Oslis and her people among the floating city known as Liberal Ark. Its guardian holy beast is a dragon named Ragnard. And finally, the Septarian of Mirage, a young girl known as Demigurus. She was given to the Kreuz family, a family of alchemists, and its guardian beast is the divine wolf Zet. Keep in mind that as of the time of this video, the remaining three Septarians, water, wind, and time, have yet to be revealed. And the divine beasts that were assigned to guard it, and who exactly they were given to, are also unknown. I guess that's something we'll find out in future sequels. For centuries, everything seemed to be going well. However, as any good story would go, conflicts began to occur, leading to the Seven Septarians to fade into obscurity. This would lead to what later would be known as the Great Collapse. In the land of Erebos, humanity began to become obsessed with power and desired for each other's destruction. And due to the Septarian of Fire and Earth's ability to grant humans wishes, they began granting those very same desires. Both Titans began to fight each other, which lasted for more than 1,000 days. After a cataclysmic battle between the Arc Rouge and the Lost Sem, it eventually ended up as a tie. The two treasures were destroyed in the battle. However, Instead of fading away, the Septarian of Fire and Earth, that was within both Titans, fused together into a being known as the Great One, which would also go by the name of the Septarian of Steel. <laughs> the Witches and Gnomes realized the terrifying power of the Great One, and with the help of the two holy beasts sworn to protect the titans, made the decision to safeguard it in order to ensure no one can abuse its power. The gnomes were known for their advanced technology, so using this, they created seven vessels, known as the Divine Knights. Although they are basically just Gundams, let's be honest. While the witches used their magic to split the power of the Great One into each of the vessels, with this, they were able to obtain their own personalities, and so they thought it was fitting to give each Divine Knight a name. Valimar, the Ashen Knight. Ordeen, the Azure Knight. Testa Rosa, the Vermilion Knight. Zector, the Palatin Knight. Agrion, the Argent Knight. El Prado, the Auric Knight. And finally, Ishmelga, the Ebon Knight. All seven were hidden away into separate temples. Only a warrior worthy enough of challenging these temples would be allowed to use their power. With the Great One now separated, a man named Adjucator Arner was named its very first emperor, and his descendants would continue his role. He would rename the land from Erebos 
to Erebonia and established the capital of Heimdall. Meanwhile, in the floating city of Liber Ark, the Oreo has gone haywire. Originally, the Oreo only passively granted wishes to owners of Gospels, devices capable of interacting with the Oreo. Over the course of time and for reasons unknown, however, the Oreo gained a mind of its own and actively sought to assist humanity, regardless of consent. Celeste Osleys, the ruler of the Borough Ark, noticed this autonomy led to the deterioration of human lives. It was no different from taking a powerful euphoric stimulant and a hallucinogen at the same time. Not only that, because of its newfound autonomy, she couldn't just wish for it to be turned off, meaning she needed an alternate power source to stop it. Her answer being the Septian veins lurking underground. Septian veins, by the way, are magical crystals and contain the seven elements. Celeste ordered her investigation team to build facilities on top of these Septian veins in order to mine the crystals in order to gain enough power to stop the Oreo. These would consist of four massive towers spread across the land, as well as an underground space underneath the Grantle region, and finally a giant wall known as the Anberg, with the purpose of firing a massive laser towards the Liberal Arc in order to transport it to another dimension. However, the Oreo became aware of Celeste's plans and considered her actions a potential threat. In turn, it sent giant robots known as Reveries in order to eliminate Celeste and her team. Thankfully, Celeste was able to avoid the reveries and successfully fire the laser and transport the Oreo. And a second barrier was created using the four device towers that were built throughout the land. This was to make sure the Oreo was incapable of returning to reality in case the first barrier were to fail. With the wish granting device and their floating city gone from human hands, Celeste and her people began to live their lives on the land below establishing herself as the first queen of the Kingdom of Liberal. <laughs> Meanwhile, in another land, the Septarian of Mirage had her own problems. Due to her human appearance, Demigurus was able to guide mankind by understanding them and everything on Earth and controlled causality. She may sound similar to the Oreo, however, Demigurus was bestowed with a personality and was just like any other human, while the Oreo was just a machine. So it's fair to assume that the same issue that Celeste had to deal with wouldn't occur with Demigurus. Right? 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 Remember, Demigurus is just like any other human, and in turn, can be ne negatively affected just like us. Over the course of many years, the Kreuz family had endlessly relied on her wish-granting abilities, abusing her power, basically using her as a slave driver for their own selfish wishes. Over time, she became so overwhelmed and became terrified of the possibility she could harm humanity in retaliation. After so many requests for wishes to be granted, she had enough and made the decision to end her own life. The Kreuz family was baffled by this decision and feared the loss of their power. They then dedicated themselves to find a replacement, even if it meant it would take over a thousand years to complete. After the Great Collapse, 
All hope had become lost after Adios' treasures disappeared, beginning the next era, the Dark Ages, which would last for 500 years. To help install hope within the people, a new organization was born known as the Septarian Church. They established the Septarian Calendar, much like our own app calendar in real life. The church would spread the teachings of Adios, and over time, it would become the most widespread religion in Zamermia. They also vowed to find any lost artifacts spread throughout the land, making it the church's property from now on. Artifacts are objects that were sent to Zamermia by Adios herself, and they contain special powers, such as being able to stop time, control gravity, summon monsters, or transform people into monsters, etc. To ensure their power would not be abused, much like the Seven Septarians, they must be confiscated. The ones responsible in finding any illegal artifacts are known as the Grosritter, more specifically a secret task force within the Grosritter known as the Dominions, or as I like to call them, the Church Avengers. There are 12 total members, and they each have a special ability known as a stigma. As to who those 12 members are, and what exactly a stigma is, I'll talk more about it later in the video when it becomes more relevant. Meanwhile, in the Empire of Erebonia, the Seven Divine Knights have received multiple Awakeners, which is just another term for pilots, by the way. Over multiple decades, each Divine Knight was able to grow a personality as they were designed to be influenced by humanity. However, the seventh and most powerful knight, Ishmaelga, was different. He was exposed to the malice of humanity, likely Awakeners full of hatred and jealousy, and had developed a similar mindset. Anger and hate this influence would lead him to become obsessed with power and began desiring the full might of the Great One for himself. To accomplish this, he needs to conduct a ritual known as the Rivalries. Remember, the power of the Great One was spread across all seven Divine Knights. So to acquire the power all for himself, he needs the other six to destroy each other, one by one, which will cause the power of the Great One to merge, just like the two giants from Ancients Past. The combatant within the final rivalry will then challenge Shmelga, where he will then absorb all the remaining power for himself. There's two problems, however. Shmelga can't function without an Awakener. Not only that, the rivalries won't work without the land being covered in strife. To ensure the stage can be set, Shmelga, using his ethereal form, spreads a curse throughout the land. Capable of influencing the minds of humans, the curse is almost like a devil's ear, focusing on people who are weak of heart. It preys on those with ins insecurities or specific hatreds. Once inflicted by the curse, a human would actively pursue their darkest desires, no matter how much they want to suppress it. I don't need it. I don't need it. Definitely don't need it. I don't need it. I need it! You could also say it's almost identical to the darkness from the Kingdom Hearts series. Which, even in those games, the darkness would prey on the insecurities of many of its characters. Although to clarify, because this is often a very common misconception, no, the curse is not mind control. A person conflicted with the curse is still 100% responsible for their actions. All the curse is doing is giving the person an incentive, but they still need to make the actions themselves. In order to prevent Ishmaelga's reign of terror, the holy beast of Earth, Argus, encountered Ishmaelga and consumed the majority of the curse and sealed itself away underground. The fuck? Ishmaelga's plans at first seemed to be all for naught, 
However, a small part of his curse still existed above ground. A massive dragon known as Zoro Agruga, who is believed to be a part of Agris, attacked the city of Heimdall. It killed most of its population and revived the bodies of the dead as zombies and vampires, making it a dominion of death and destruction, which lasted for more than a century. Which is basically just the plot of Breath of the Wild. Damn you, Nintendo, for ripping off trails! With the capital occupied, the Emperor at the time evacuated the citizens. Oh, hell no, I'm out of here. They then migrated to the east to form a new capital, St. Ark. In the year 371, almost 200 years later, the 7th Emperor Hector Rice Arner I gathered his forces and went to reclaim the city. There, he found the Vermilion Knight Testarossa underground and became its awakener. With its power, Hector was able to finally slay Zora Agruga and put an end to the 200 year long chaos. However, this came at a price. Before he knew it, the blood of the dragon consumed the entirety of Testarossa and Hector was killed and Testarossa itself was infected by the curse. Not only that, but Rosella, the holy beast of fire, was also killed during the battle. Rosella's familiar, who went by the same name, then took over her master's role as the Elder of the Witches and changed her appearance to look like a human. Although to make things simpler and not get confused between the two, I'll just call her Rose. After the capital was reclaimed, Hector's son had Rose and the Chief of the Gnomes, Black Aberic, seal Testarossa underneath Valtham Palace. And with the dragon dead, the people of St. Ark were able to return to their original home. They rebuilt the city of Heimdall, and it became known as the Vermilion City, named after the Divine Knight. After the city was saved, however, the gnomes suddenly oh, cut contact with the witches and disappeared from the world. While it was unknown to the witches at the time, this was because the gnomes were inflicted with Ishmelga's curse and became one of its underlings. Ironic, considering the gnomes were one of its original creators. Around the year 700 of the Septarian calendar, the Kroos family was still hard at work in creating their new Demigurus. And at long last, they finally succeeded. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. At least partially. Ah. They had created a homunculus, an artificial human. However, it lacked the power of the previous goddess, and it was no different from a normal human girl. So for this humunculus to gain godlike power, they created and tasked a separate organization known as the DG Cult to safeguard her. The G standing for the word Gnosis, meaning wisdom. What does the D stand for, you ask? These nuts! <laughs> to transform her into a goddess, the cult would kidnap children, take them to lodges throughout the land, and sacrifice them. Well, that got dark. The souls of those children would then convert into the body of the homunculus. One such lodge would be separate from the others, however, going by the name Paradise. And trust me, I'll get there eventually. The cult would continue to deny the existence of Audios as they believed that she was only made up by the church for the sake of winning over the people. And in their eyes, their homunculus was the true goddess. The cult named the artificial girl Kia, derived from the idea that she would become the key to the origin of everything, meaning key of all. Meanwhile, the Kroos family, now separating themselves from the cult, has started a banking business called the IBC, in the hopes of using it to gather enough funds 
to complete their goal. Within the Empire of Arabonia, Rose guides a young woman named Leon Sandlot towards the Divine Knight Agrion. However, she refuses it, believing it was too powerful, and seals it underneath Lonrhein Castle. It wouldn't be long, however, that she would need to use this newfound power to save the ones she loves. Meanwhile, a young man named Dreykel's Freis Einer moves to the Nord Highlands. Normally, as a man with the Arnor bloodline, Dracos would have been the next emperor of the Empire of Erebonia. However, within the past couple hundred years, a family of nobles had risen to power, where certain laws and rights for commoners and nobles were commonplace. And unfortunately for Dracos, his mother was a commoner, which meant that to the noble faction, Dracos was unworthy of the Arter name and so he was banished to the Nord Highlands, never to be seen ever again. Despite this, Dracos had become friends with a family of nomads that were living in the Highlands, and he intended to live the rest of his life in peace. Meanwhile, trouble was brewing in the Empire. Emperor Valus V was said to have countless wives, Dracos' mother included. As a result of this, he had many sons who would become eligible for the throne, and shortly after his death in the year 947, his sixth son, Prince Manfred, was the one next in line. However, before he had the chance to seize the throne, he was assassinated, the culprit being the fourth prince, Orthrus. Orthrus had become obsessed with power and wanted the throne for himself. Orthrus seized the capital by military coup d'etat, and once he was in control, he declared himself the new emperor and began purging all those who dared to oppose him. Of course, his remaining brothers were not happy with this, as they believed the right of the throne belonged to them instead. This led to a large-scale civil war between multiple factions in which all five brothers, excluding Dracos, declared themselves to be the 73rd Emperor of Arabonia. To give himself an upper hand in the war, Orthrus went underground to Valflame Palace and found the Cursed Divine Knight which fought the Dark Dragon centuries ago. With Testarossa at his disposal, it seemed his reign of terror was unstoppable. Meanwhile in the Nord Highlands, Dreykel's childhood friend, Roland Vander, tracked him down and told him of the recent atrocities. At first he refused, wanting nothing to do with the land that exiled him for simply existing. But when Roland showed his friend the remains of a nearby burned village, Dreykel's was horrified and made the decision to fight back. It would not be long after this when Dreykel's would come face to face with Leon Sandlot, and they joined forces. Leanne decided to finally make use of her newly found Divine Knight, while Rose led Dracos to the town of Trista to undergo a trial to acquire his own Divine Knight, Valimar, the Ashen Knight. With their two giant mechas, as well as through the help of Roland Vander, the Eisenritter, an army of knights, and even a friend of Leanne's named Shion Arsed, the pair were successfully able to drive back Orthus's army, as well as taking down his other brothers and allying them in their cause. But in a desperate attempt to win the war in his favor, Orthrus awakened the Vermilion Apocalypse from the cursed Testarossa, transforming the city of Heimdall to a hellish landscape in Valflame Palace into the Infernal Castle. After a long battle, Dracos was able to finally defeat Orthus, putting an end to what would later be known as the War of the Lions. However, as if history was doomed to repeat itself, Sandlot and even Roland Vander was killed during the battle. 
despite losing two of the most important people in his life. Cry for me. Dracul's returns home victorious and is named the 73rd Emperor for saving the Empire. Meanwhile, Rose took Leanne Sandlot's body to the witch's village for a funeral. But after a half a year, she suddenly awakened. I'm dead! Don't worry, I'm still alive. When you forge a pact with your Divine Knight and die, you are transformed into an immortal after death. As long as the Divine Knight itself doesn't receive any fatal damage. This may appear to be a blessing, however in reality, this is the result of Ishmelga's curse. Leanne is now forced to one day participate in the robberies, meaning her death until then is all but inevitable. With this, Leon Sandlot will now roam the world for the rest of her days, and lent Lonrhine Castle to her ally, Shion Arsed. With this honor, the Arsed family added an S into their name. Meanwhile, Roland Vander's descendants took it upon themselves to act as bodyguards for the future heirs of the Arnor throne. And finally, Dracul's founded Thor's Military Academy to teach the youth of the future. During the final years of his life, however, Dreykels held a burden he told no one. A voice that would continue to harass him until the end of his days. Relinquish it to me. It belongs to me. Your soul. Your entire being. <laughs> you never do tire of this, do you? You are the embodiment of delusion. Repulsive, without a single shred of dignity, unlike Valimar. Compared to me, the Ashen Knight is nothing more than scrap metal. Accept it! You. With the heart of a lion deserve better. You alone deserve to pilot me. Dracos? Uh. Damn. The Argent One comes. But it matters not. You shall never escape my grasp. No matter where you flee, your weary soul will never find refuge. Dracos, what was that just now? The land of Calvard was originally a monarchy. However, it underwent a revolution and was recreated as a republic. Similarly to the real-life United States of America, the country is now run by a senate and a president, and within the next hundred years, Calvert will eventually become the second most powerful country in the world. Unfortunately, that's all I got to say. Please note that as far as the first 10 games go, lore about Calvert is scarce. You will most likely learn more about its history in Trails Through Daybreak, as that is the game where it takes place. For now, however, it's important to know that Calvert will form a century-old rivalry of Erebonia. In the land where the Kors family and Demigurus once resided, it's now been officially been given a name. Crossbell. It's named due to the giant bell in the middle of town. It has been established as an autonomous state. Over time, it will eventually become the biggest commerce city in the world. Despite its status as an autonomous state, however, Arabonia and Calvert would often fight over its ownership, likely because Crossbell itself being smack dab in the middle of both countries, which plays a big factor as to why. This battle as to who owns Crossbell would last for more than a hundred years.
in the sovereign state of Lebanon, a man named Professor Upstein, Jesus Christ, why did they name him that, finds the Septian veins underground that Celeste Oslis used to seal the Oreo over a thousand years ago. Using those crystals, he invents orbital technology, allowing the creation of multiple modern day devices. Inventions such as cars, guns, airships, phones, light bulbs, escalators, you name it. As well as a device known as an Orbmit, which basically allows users to use magic as a weapon, albeit in a technological perspective. Before Upstein's inventions, Zemermia was all medieval and outdated, while now, human society has now exceeded in technology. Upstein would later become known as the father of the Orbal Revolution, changing humanity forever. After his death, he passed his work onto his three disciples, Professor Russell, Professor Smith, and Professor Hamilton. This would lead to the formation of four major technology organizations. The Reinford Company, led by Gwyn Reinford, his daughter Irina, and her husband Rhymes. They stationed themselves in Erebonia, and Smith had a hand in its creation. The Verne Company, which belongs to Calvert, which Professor Hamilton played a part in its creation. The ZCF, Zeese Central Factory, which stationed itself in Liberal, where Russell spends his days creating inventions. And finally, the Upstein Foundation, existing to continue the legacy of the man who started it all. This is also around the time when the Bracer Guild is founded. Bracers play an important role throughout the series, and they help people in times of need. The Principality of North Ambria was known for its cold, harsh climate, and for years had suffered with economic issues. Despite this, it was still a thriving country and had room for improvement. However, this soon all came to an end when a sudden disaster struck one that would change the country forever. Suddenly, a massive pillar of salt randomly appeared within the country out of nowhere. At first, it seemed harmless. However, its dangerous capabilities soon became clear. With just one touch, anything and anyone within its reach would dissolve into nothing forcing the citizens to evacuate from the capital of Palask, including a teenager by the name of Gorg Wiesman, who lost his parents and was taken in by the church, a boy named Loe, who soon migrated to a small village in Arabonia, and even the ruler Prince Belmond himself, who cowardly fled the incident, leaving his own citizens to die. Within just a single day, one-third of North Ambria's entire population was killed in the disaster. This tragedy would become known as the Salt Pail Incident. No one knew where the Salt Pail came from, although recent Trails games have confirmed that it originated from another dimension known as the Beyond. But regardless of its origins, because of what happened, the country's economy became even worse than it was before. And so many citizens and even leaders of the country were forced to become Jaegers, which are basically the series equivalent to bandits, by the way. Their leader being a man named Colonel Valestein, alongside his adopted daughter. They would rob and pillage small villages, just so the country of Northambria could survive. Not long after Colonel Valestein died in one of their raids, Prince Balmond suddenly returned, apologizing for being a coward, and vowed to retake the country. His citizens understood his apology, okay, I forgive you, and allowed him to become their leader once again. And so the Jaeger stopped their pillaging, and they all lived happily ever after. Nah, I'm just kidding. They executed his ass. With their previous leader now dead, 
the Northern Yeagers established North Ambria as a dictatorship. Around this time, a famous swordsman by the name of Yun Kefai began training disciples, that being three very important characters. Cassius Wright, a man who would become a general in Liberal, as well as his right-hand man, Alan Richard, and Arios McLean, who would join the police force in Crossbell and became friends with the legendary detective Guy Bannings. Kafai has two more disciples, however I will talk more about them later in the video. <laughs> Meanwhile in Erebonia, the Hexen clan are still active and a witch named Isola Millestein tracks down the leader of the gnomes, Black Alberic, after finding out the truth of Ishmelga and how he sees control over the gnomes. They have an epic battle and fight each other to the death, leaving no survivors. However, Black Alberic was different from the witches. Similar to Xehanort and Lushu from the Kingdom Hearts series, he is able to send his soul to another vessel, which is how he's been alive for thousands of years. He decides for his new body to be an important figure within Erebonia's Reinford Company, Rhine's Reinford, who in reality was a descendant of the gnomes. And through him, secretly built robotic weapons known as Soldocks, which are basically just mini divine knights. Not long after, however, an assassin named Kruger, someone from a certain society which I'll get into later, was sent there to gather his research. Alberic then finally seized full control of Rhines and retaliated. <laughs> Believing she killed him, Arena Reinford unexpectedly took Kruger in and gave her a new name, Sharon, and told her that she can return to her society once Franz returns. In other words, never. Of course, she said this without realizing that Alberic is very much still alive. It would not be long after this where Arena took full control of the Reinford Company from her father and became its new chairman. But there's still one question left unanswered. What society did Sharon come from? Well... For this next segment, I'll be talking about the two most important villains in the entire franchise. First, the Society of Ouroboros. It's unclear when exactly this society was formed, however, it can be assumed that within the timeline, Ouroboros started after the Salt Pale incident. Its leader is a woman known as the Grandmaster, and this group has basically appeared in almost every single game within the franchise. The organization is split into two different ranks, the Anguists and the Enforcers. The seven Anguists are the Grandmaster's eyes and ears, and they exist to follow her demands. We haven't been introduced to all the Anguists just yet, so I'll list the ones that we do know. The second Anguist, Vita Clotilde, the Azure Abyss. She was originally a part of the Hexen Clan, but after Isola Millstein's death, Cry for me. Vita, alongside her bird familiar Grianos, left her younger stepsister behind and became a wandering witch. This led her to come across the Grandmaster and decided to join the organization for unknown reasons. Despite being one of Ouroboros' elite members, however, she has a hidden agenda one that would allow her to avenge the death of Isola. The third Anguist, Gorg Wiesman, the Faceless, who, if you remember, was one of the survivors of the Salt Pale incident. He migrated to the Septian Church 
and served as a priest there for years, but for unknown reasons was banished as a heretic. Now a member of Ouroboros, he's become obsessed with creating the ultimate weapon and has been tasked by the Grandmaster to conduct their first mission, the Gospel Plan. The Fourth Anguis, the Oathbreaker. While this Anguis is currently unknown, let alone their gender, we do know a little bit about them. They were originally from a separate organization of assassins known as the Order of the Moonlight Horse. Ouroboros destroyed this group entirely, and one of its members, someone who went by the title of the Thousand Oathbreaker, became the Fourth Anguis. This is just speculation on my part, but I have a feeling we'll be seeing this person soon in Trails Through Daybreak. I should also point out that Sharon, or rather Kruger, was also originally from the Order of the Moonlight Horse. The Sixth Anguis, Professor Novartis. I'm a a stereotypical mad scientist, Experiment. he acts as Ouroboros' main source of technology. He created and heads the 13 factories, which, as the name suggests, are 13 facilities where robots and weapons, known as archaisms, are manufactured. The archaisms act as Ouroboros' own private army, and are generally deployed alongside enforcers on missions. It should also be noted that the Black Workshop from the Gnomes is one of these facilities. Last but not least, the seventh Anguis, Aryan Road, the Steel Maiden. If this woman seems familiar to you, you would be right. She is actually Leon Sandlot. After wandering the world for 200 plus years, she came across the Grandmaster and joined Ouroboros for a specific agenda. She also established a small group of knights to personally accompany her, known as the Stall Ritter, who are basically the modern day equivalent to the Eisen Ritter, who accompanied her during the War of the Lions. Their names being Duvali, Ineas, and Anea. Although Duvali is the only one that everyone cares about, let's be honest. Sucks to be you! Next, I'll talk a little bit about the Enforcers. Enforcers directly work under any of the seven Anguis, and are usually the ones out to do the dirty work. There are a total of 21 Enforcers, each representing one of the tarot cards from the Arcana. Enforcer number zero, Campanella, the Fool. Despite being an Enforcer, he's arguably just as important as an Anguis, and works directly under the Grandmaster. Aside from that, however, there's a lot about him that's currently unknown, so I can't really talk about that much right now. As for the remaining Enforcers, I'll wait to talk about them as I go further into the video. In Erebonia, another important character has just started a family with his wife and child. A man by the name of Giliath Osborne. While he didn't know it at the time, he is actually the reincarnation of Emperor Dracos. Osborne had made a name for himself within the military, becoming friends with General Vinduck and General Craig, and even being promoted as a general himself. It seemed his life was set for greatness. Of course, that means it needs to go to shit at some point. One day, he uncovered a conspiracy among the noble officers. A man named Colonel Arendelle was attempting to start a war with Liberal in hopes of annexing the country into Erebonia. Osborne seemingly convinced them to stop. However, they retaliated in the most horrifying way possible. They attacked Osborne's home and killed his beloved wife and fatally injured his son's heart. Begging any god or demon to save his son's life, he heard a voice. A voice 
that was somewhat familiar to him. Oh, how long I've waited to hear those words. Waited and waited, Trikles, for two hundred long years. This time you will be my awakener, not the Ashen Knights. Agree. And I will deliver your son from death. But I don't care anymore. Take my body, take my soul, do what you will! So long as you save my son, it doesn't matter what happens to me! Ebonite Ishmelga! It was at that moment when Osborne ripped out his own heart and replaced it with his son's. In that instant, Osborne was made into an immortal. With Osborne seemingly out of commission, Colonel Arendelle ordered hired Jaegers to attack the small village of Hamel, where the boy Loe, now a teenager, resides. Almost everyone, including children, were killed, with Loe and his friend Joshua Stray being the only ones that survived. Although they didn't know at the time, another boy also lived to see the day and was picked up by a random passerby. With Hamel destroyed, Arendelle and his nobles blamed the Kingdom of Liberal for the incident and used that as an excuse for war. The Erebonian army launched an attack, blazing through the Heinberg Wall and occupied the entire kingdom killing many citizens along the way, with the capital of Gransol being Liberal's last line of defense. All hope seemed lost. That is until one of Kafai's disciples swoops in and saves the day, the one and only Cassius Bright. He used his brilliant tactics to fend off the Erebonians. Oh no, he's hot! With that, what would later be known as the 100 Days War came to a close. As a repercussion for the war, the Liberian Queen writes a peace treaty between the two nations, while Arabonia apologizes for their mistake. Yulioth Osborne then suddenly returned and reveals that Colonel Arendelle was the true culprit behind the tragedy of Hamel. Not long after, Arendelle is executed for his crimes, and as a reward, Osborne is named Chancellor of the Nation. Osborne, with Ashmelga influencing his actions from within, has 70% of the army under his leadership, and made it his mission to annex any neighboring countries in order to spread the curse and eventually awaken the Great One. These actions would lead to Osborne getting a nickname the Blood and Iron Chancellor, and he would crush anybody that would get in his way. If they even think of trying to stand in my way, I'll crush them beneath my heel. All for the sake of his new master. At least, that is what Ishmelga has been led to believe, because in reality, Osborne has his own agenda up his sleeve. Osborne left his son to an old friend, thinking that he wouldn't be safe with him if he was going to accomplish his goal. But before Osborne can accomplish anything, as the leader of the reformist faction, he needs full control of Erebonia's military, and 70% is not enough. And unfortunately for him, the Noble Alliance, or rather, the Four Great Houses, is in his way. Consisting of four powerful nobles, the Noble Alliance controls the remaining 30% of Erebonia's military. First, House Alborea of the Cruzen province, led by Duke, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Douche Helmet Alborea, along with his two sons. They reside in the city of Berhard. 
House Ragnar of the Nortia province, led by Duke Gerhard Ragnar, with his daughter, who shall not be named. They reside in the city of Roller and has connections with the Reinford Company, although he's not directly involved with the company, and the family only controls one of its factories. This is because a noble family controlling what is essentially Erebonia's entire source of technology would cause an imbalance in power. Next is House High Arms of the Sutherland Province, residing in the old capital of St. Ark. Its lord being Duke... I am Ferdinand von Eyre. Duke Ferdinand High Arms, with his son Patrick. And finally, the leader of the Noble Alliance, Douche Corrier Cayenne, who controls the La Mer Province in the city of Ordis. Not only are these four an obvious obstacle in Osborne's plan, they all hold a grudge towards the man, believing his title as Chancellor is unworthy, purely for the fact that he is a man of commoner blood. Let's just say Osborne has his work cut out for him. I should also point out that Victor S. Arsed, the descendant of Sheehan Arsed, and lord of the foggy town of Lagram is also a noble, albeit he is not affiliated with the alliance, as well as Theo Schwarzer, another noble and the ruler of a small village of Amir, was ridiculed and banished from the alliance for reasons that will be unveiled later. Meanwhile, in Liberal, the two Hamel survivors, Joshua and Loe, join the society of Ouroboros. Loe is subjected to Arian Rhodes' training, and after winning against her, he is given the weapon Kernhitter from the Grandmaster, and is deemed Enforcer Number 2, the Blade Lord. While the third Anguis, Weisman, has taken an interest with Joshua, using the knowledge from his past as a priest from the Siptian Church slash Grosswitter, he performs experiments on the boy in order to create an artificial stigma. Now that it's relevant, a stigma is a supernatural power that raises the physical and magical limits of its host. Think of it as a tattoo upon the soul. As I mentioned earlier in the video, normally these abilities are unique to the dominions of the Grosrunner, but Weisman was able to make an exception. He uses Joshua as his personal assassin, and he is deemed Enforcer Number 13, the Black Fang. Chancellor Osborne comes across a young man claiming to have ties with the Alborea family. He claims that Douche Helmut Alborea hired a Jaeger group called Arngamer to assassinate him. Following his advice, Osborne quickly got rid of the group of Jaegers, murdering every single one of them. As a reward for this accomplishment, he nominated this young man as his first Ironblood, which to Osborne is a title given to only of the Chancellor's most devout followers. Considering this young man's own father neglected to acknowledge him, he couldn't be more happier. In a twisted turn of events, Osborne came across the late Colonel Arendelle's son, Lector Arendelle, who after losing his father, had since become a member of the Erebonian Intelligence Division. Feeling pity for the boy, he asked him to join his Ironbloods. Lecter agrees, with the hopes that he may one day get revenge for his father's death. However, he ends up forming a complicated affection towards Osborne, and also pieced together what his true intentions were, which lowers his resolve. Regardless, if Osborne were to ever stray from his path, Lecter would take his life. 
A musical company going by the name Rivadelt has been going strong for decades. They also composed the song Whereabouts of the Light, which is a track that you will be hearing a lot in Shells in the Sky. That's not important, I just think it's a cute detail. <laughs> One night, the daughter of the owners of this company, a girl named Claire Rivadelt, is on a car ride with her parents and little brother, Emil. However, it was caught in an accident. Her brother and parents are killed, making Claire the sole survivor. Cry for me. The rights of the company are left to her uncle, and he takes her in. Years later, Claire pieces together that her own uncle was the one that, who caused the accident. She confronts him, but unexpectedly threatens her that he'll blame the murder on his own niece if she even dares to report it to the police. So she backs down. Driven to a corner, Claire has no idea what to do. That is until a certain man approaches her. I was a friend of your father's in military school. I thought the accident seemed peculiar. Do forgive me for allowing you to suffer for so long on your own. You have a gift. Enhanced cognition. It allows you to grasp every detail, great or small, of any given situation in an instant. It must have awakened during the accident. I was going to mete out the murderer's punishment myself, but I've changed my mind. You have the means and the ability. Why not use them to avenge your family? Following his advice, she finds the evidence to indict her uncle as the culprit, and he is sentenced to death. But this came at a price. The rest of her family, from her uncle's side, blames her for his death, and she is ridden from guilt from her actions. She leaves the rights of her musical company to one of her relatives, abandons the rest of her family, and joins Chancellor Osborne as one of his iron bloods. Years later, the Black Workshop has been hard at work. They have been attempting to create their own homunculus for a specific purpose, stealing the same technology from the Kreuz family. Hundreds of them are created, however most are failures. After many attempts over the course of many years, they finally succeed in creating two homunculuses, Model 0Z73 and Model 0Z74. 0C73 is sold off to Gilead Osborne and is deemed one of his iron ones. Osborne also decides to give her a name, Milliam Orion, while 0C74 is sent to the Noble Alliance. On the surface, establishing the Iron Bloods may seem like Osborne is just trying to create his own private army, brainwashing these individuals for his own selfish reasons. But in reality, Osborne really does care for these people, and this is just him replacing the son that he lost. Within the city of Jirai, the Erebonian Empire offered this nearby city a deal to build a railway from Erebonia leading into Jirai itself. Years prior, Jirai had previously relied on North Ambria for its resources, but that was thrown out the window when the salt pail arrived. So the mayor agreed believing this would help the city's economy. A few days later, the railway leading towards the city of Jirai after it finished construction was unexpectedly bombed. Erebonia then accused Jirai of a lack of security protocols and for not apprehending the suspect fast enough. To make things worse, the economy had begun to crash once more. Chancellor Osborne himself came face to face with the mayor to offer he should take over the city to restore the economy. In short, annexing Jirai into Erebonia itself. That was the moment when the mayor realized who the true culprit behind the bombings was all along. So he obviously refused 
and vowed to fix the, key, the economy himself. Unfortunately, he couldn't find a solution, and the people of Durai began restless and angry, pressuring the mayor to accept the deal. He eventually gave in to his citizens' demands, and reluctantly gave the city to Erebonia. After failing to prove Durai's independence, he died of depression soon after, leaving his grandson behind. Desperate for revenge, the mayor's grandson formed a terrorist group known as the Imperial Liberation Front, recruiting members that also wanted to stand up to the Blood and Iron Chancellor, one being a survivor of the Jaeger group Angarmer, its leader Vulcan. The mayor's grandson also came across Vita Clotilde, who intended to use him for her own agenda. She trained this young man to become the Awakener of the Azure Knight. Across the entire continent, the DG cult is still at large, terrorizing the world behind the scenes by kidnapping children. One of its most recent victims, a five-year-old girl named Rennie Hayworth, is taken to one of their lodges known as Paradise. Yep, we're there, ladies and gentlemen. As I mentioned before, this lodge was different. While the cult created the lodges for child experimentation, this one was, well, um, um, hmm, uh, um, hmm, how do I say this without getting demonetized? Oh, I know! After a year of hell, the young girl is rescued by Loe and Joshua, who take her into Ouroboros. And much like Weisman, Professor Novartis took an interest in the girl. Rennie was subjected to his experiments, and she developed supernatural intelligence. She was then equipped with a giant archaism called Peter Mater, who unlike other archaisms, had some level of intelligence. And she develops a parental relationship with the robot, after finding out that her own parents had replaced her with another child. Cry for me. She's renamed to Ren, and she's deemed Enforcer Number 15, the Angel of Slaughter. Not long after, word of the DG Colt's actions has gotten around, and on an extremely rare occasion, the Arabonia, Calvert, Liberal, Crossbell governments, and even Ouroboros, work together to abolish them forever. A task force comprising of both the Bracer Guild and the Crossbell Police join forces. The Bracers include Cassius Bright, who has since retired as a general and became a bracer after the 100 Days War, and Zen Vatek, the Immovable, who is a character that exists. Then there's the Crossbell Detectives, Sergei Liu, Alex Dudley, and two legendary detectives, Guy Bannings and Arios McLean. Together, they abolished every last one of the cult's lodges, preventing any more children from being sacrificed. Persona! But the cult's members committed suicide before the task force was able to capture any of them for questioning, and most of the children didn't make it. That is, except one. As Guy was able to rescue a girl named Tio Plato. For this accomplishment, the man is hailed as a hero. Guy's celebration in demolishing the cult would be short-lived, however, because the detective discovers something unbelievable. He uncovered the truth behind the DG cult's actions, that being that the Kreuz family were the true masterminds. Not only that, his longtime friend, 
Arios McLean was also involved. He confronts Arios about this and suggests a theory that the Chorus family had created an artificial human and was trying to recreate a god from a thousand years ago. Having no choice, Arios attacks him to a battle to the death in order to silence him. But even he can't find it in his heart to hurt his friend, leaving to an unknown gunman to do the job for him. And Guy breathes his last. Not long after, Guy's little brother, driven with grief, moves in with his uncle in Calvert so that he can train to become a police officer to one day solve the murder of his brother and also to surpass him. Woo! After the longest exposition dump in the history of exposition dumps, we are finally ready to start the first game in the timeline, Trails in the Sky, first chapter. You know, I should really check how long this video has gone for. I'm starting to think making this video was a mistake. The story begins on a rainy night. Joshua, Enforcer 13 of Ouroboros, was sent by Weisman to assassinate the great Cassius Bright. Before he's able to commit the deed, however, Cassius swiftly defeats Joshua and takes him into his home, where his daughter Estelle resides. おい、今帰ったぞ。父さんの方も何もなかった Hey, don't be sexist. You little shit. It was on that day when Joshua was adopted into the Bright family. And for the next five years, he lives with his new stepsister and stepfather, completely forgetting of his time as an enforcer. Estelle also trained alongside him with her bow staff in the hopes that she may one day become a bracer. This is because her mother was killed during the 100 Days War, which motivates Estelle as she wants to prevent a tragedy like that from happening ever again. And Joshua shares this dream. Now both 16, in the morning of the year 1202, Estelle catches Joshua playing his favorite song, Whereabouts of the Light. Turn that shit down, Joshua. People are trying to sleep! Sorry, Estelle. Today is the day when Estelle and Joshua finally get to become bracers. After a training session from her childhood friend, Sherzard Harvey, she's deemed a bracer. Yep, you mean junior hero, Donald? And begins her first set of tasks. Meanwhile, in the Empire of Arabonia, Weisman has something up his sleeve. He sends one of Ouroboros' enforcers, Sharon Kruger, to attack Sarah Valestine, the daughter of Colonel Valestine from the Salt Pal incident, and currently the youngest A-rank bracer. This was done to distract the female bracer from being able to get in the way of their other plan to bomb the unguarded bracer guilds in Heimdall. 
Cassius then received a letter from his friend, Victor Arsed, to deal with the problem. Nandato? The next morning, he leaves his two children behind, telling them it was just a business trip. However, this was exactly what Ouroboros wanted. As with Sarah being occupied, that would guarantee Cassius would leave Liberal to solve the issue himself. With Cassius out of the picture, their pawn is able to enact his plan without the Divine Blade interfering. With their father out of town, Estelle and Joshua spend the next few days fulfilling bracer jobs. One of these jobs include investigating an ancient tower by request from a reporter. Atop the tower, they meet an archaeologist named Professor Alba, who's researching the Seven Septarians, and he'll offer his aid towards the duo throughout the adventure. Not long after, they find themselves in another job involving finding a stolen heirloom from the mayor of Roland. They find the culprit, a sky bandit named Josette Capua, and her brothers Kyle and Don Capua. Before Estelle and co. are able to capture Josette, however, she escapes. Uh, bye! Fuck. Believing that the Sky Bandits kidnapped Cassius, who had gone missing since his departure, the duo, alongside Sherzard, travel to the city of Bose, where they meet the traveling bard Oliver Linehan, who is also the best character in this entire franchise. After coming across a mysterious masked man, they work together to defeat the Sky Bandits. However, their leader seemed to be acting strangely, and couldn't remember exactly what they were trying to do. Hmm. They turned them in to the Liberian Colonel, the one and only Alan Richard. Not only that, but Cassius was not on the airliner that the Sky Bandits had stolen. So he's actually safe from harm, making this entire chapter completely pointless. But hey, at least it gave us this beautiful speck of a man. The duo arrive in the city of Ruan, where they meet Chloe Rhines, a girl working at the nearby orphanage. Aww. I sure hope nothing bad happens. <laughs> I spoke too soon. Chloe is determined to find the arsonist, so Estelle and Joshua agree to help out. But before the trio can get to work, they meet a bracer named Agate Croster, and he decides to kick them off the job. Wow, what an asshole! With nothing else to do, they decide to help Chloe with her school festival. Where this happens... I will never get tired of this trope. By pure chance, they follow a man named Gilbert Stein, who reveals the true culprit, Mayor Dalmore. Before Estelle and the others can arrest him, however, Dalmore traps them by using an illegal artifact with the ability to stop time. Before he's able to kill them, however, a light shimmers from the black object inside Estelle's pocket, and the artifact ceases to function, which gives the duo the opportunity to arrest him. However, before he's able to answer any questions, he seems to have gotten amnesia, just like Don Capua from before. Hmm. Meanwhile, Agate chases down a group of masked men that was seen alongside Dalmore, and the same masked man from before makes a reappearance, alongside the best song ever created.
Next stop is the city of Zeese, the home of Professor Russell, one of Upstein's three disciples. Estelle and Joshua came here to ask the professor oh to investigate the mysterious black object which Cassius had mailed them through a letter. However, when the professor performs an analysis, power from the entire city goes out, at least for a few minutes. To kill time while the professor figures everything out, Estelle, Joshua, and the professor's granddaughter, Tita, take a break in the hot springs. Because every JRPG has to have some kind of fan service moment. <laughs> this is also when Estelle realizes her true feelings towards Joshua, which the game had been foreshadowing up to this point. Oh no, he's hot! When they return, Professor Russell's lab was ransacked, with the man mysteriously missing. They track down the same group of soldiers that Agate would chase down, and follow them in one of the four towers. Although, because of Tita, they escape. This is all your fault, you little shit. No! Estelle, Joshua, Agate, and Tita then work together to infiltrate the nearby Lyston Fortress, believing Professor Russell was being held within. Inside, they are in for a pleasant surprise. Colonel Richard talking with the professor and revealing himself to be the mastermind behind everything. And his goal is to acquire the Oreo, the Septarian of Space. With the help of Major Sid, they are able to save Russell and escape from the fortress. To stop Richard's plans, they need to tell the Queen of Liberal what he's been doing. Thankfully, Douche Dunin has been setting up a tournament, with the winner given the privilege to have dinner in the castle. Oddly convenient timing! After winning the tournament, with a little help from Professor Alba, Estelle and Joshua make their way into the castle and dress up as maids to have a talk with the queen. I'd hit it. Oh, and um, Zen is here, I guess, too. She reveals, however, that Richard put her in house arrest. And it was at that moment when Richard finally enacts his coup d'etat and kidnaps the princess. Estelle and Joshua rush to the scene and they meet Chloe, who is revealed to have been Princess Claudia Oslis this whole time. Meanwhile, Richard begins his assault and makes his way underground. The very same underground facility that the ancient Celeste Oslis built all those years ago, and he believes that the Oreo was being kept down there this whole time. And the black object from before, known as the Gospel, will unlock it. Richard then reveals his ultimate plan, to use the Oreo's power to eliminate the neighboring countries, Erebonia and Calvert respectively. While it is true that a peace treaty was made between Erebonia and Liberal, that doesn't mean that Erebonia and also Calvert are still not the two most powerful countries on the continent. By the might of both of their militaries, they could still swiftly destroy the small kingdom of Liberal in an instant. Not only that, but Cassius, the hero that saved the kingdom 10 years ago, retired to become a bracer. Terrified of the possibility of these two massive giants attacking Liberal once again, and with no hero to save them, Richard felt he had no choice but to acquire the power of the Oreo to avoid inev inevitable destruction. Estelle reminds him, however, that Cassius wasn't the only one who saved the country. It was the effort of the entire military that fended off Erebonia. Not a single man. And if they were to attack again, all we need to do is work together. Basically, Estelle's got the power of friendship, and Richard has no friends. Cry for me. After an epic battle, 
she and Joshua are able to defeat him. This is when Joshua figures out the truth that Richard is just like Don Capua and Mayor Dalmore, that his memories were manipulated, and that a certain someone had to have given him the gospel, and that the Oreo was never down here in the first place. Considering how far he's come, however, Richard doesn't care and activates the gospel, initiating a similar power outage just like in Zeus. Then suddenly, a reverie robot attacks. All hope seemed to be lost for the duo. That is until a certain man appeared to save them. <laughs> After a wholesome reunion with Cassius, Richard is arrested for his crimes. Welcome! leaving to the Divine Blade to clean up his mess. He rejoins the military as a general and promotes Estelle from Junior Bracer to Senior Bracer. <laughs> With everything settled down, the party all enjoy a festival and Estelle takes this opportunity to confess her feelings to Joshua. She leaves for a second to buy the two some ice cream as she figures out how she's going to say it. Leaving Joshua alone, and Professor Alba appears to say hello. At least, that's what you would think at first. Because Joshua, once again, puts the pieces together. That Professor Alba, throughout the adventure, was there the whole time. And as if he was an Ace Attorney villain, all he needs to do is slightly turn his head to reveal his true identity. The third Anguis, Gorg Wiesman. Wiesman has been using Richard as a puppet in order to unlock the Oreo's first barrier. Not only that, he's also been manipulating Joshua ever since he was adopted by Cassius. In fact, that was the entire reason why Joshua was sent to kill Cassius. The intent was to never kill him. He knew that Cassius would defeat Joshua and would take him in as his own son. In short, he took advantage of Cassius' kindness and planted a spy within his family. And the spy would leak information to Wiesman even though he never even knew what he was doing. Horrified by this revelation, Joshua confronts Estelle and tells her the whole truth. And he, well, I'll just play the scene here. Otokonokoa,五年もの間、素敵な夢を見せてもらいました。本当なら、その男の子には許されるはずもなかった夢を。だけど、夢はいつか覚めるものです。君のお父さんを暗殺しようとして失敗したのも。そして今までずっと君たちを裏切り続けていたことも男の子は本当の意味で救いようがない存在だったそこにいるだけで不幸と最悪をもたらすようなそんな汚れた存在だったんだ私の目を見てよ
何かに苦しみながら必死に頑張ってたことも知ってるそんなヨシアのことを私は好きになったんだからよしよ。何今の口の中に流れて即効性のある睡眠誘導剤だよ副作用はないから安心して<笑>どどうして君と一緒にいて幸せだったけど同時にとても苦しかった明るい光が濃い影を作るように君と一緒にいればいるほど僕は自分の忌まわしい本性を思い知らされるようになったからだから出会わなければよかったと思ったこともあった今まで本当にありがとう出会った時から君のことが大好きだったよ。さよなら、エステル。What? What the fuck? Trails in the Sky, second chapter, immediately begins with Estelle waking up after Joshua drugged her. Cassius tells her more of the story that Joshua was a member of Ouroboros, a secret society, and that she can't see him ever again. Estelle says, Fuck you, Dad, and runs off to Roland in a desperate attempt to find him. There, she comes across insensitive jerk. I mean, Cabbage Man. I mean, the guy that Falcom keeps forgetting exists. I mean, Kevin Graham, who helps her cope with what happened. Cassius apologizes for what he said and offers to train her so she's ready to find Joshua. Estelle is then sent to Lemon State, the headquarters of the Bracer Guild, where she trains alongside Annalis, another Bracer. Who is also an apprentice to Master Kafai. This place, also, for whatever reason, has some of the best elevator music I've ever heard. For the next four chapters, Estelle travels across l a b o r a l In order to find information on Joshua's whereabouts. Along the way, she confronts a group of enforcers from Ouroboros. In Ruan, she reunites with Chloe and Oliver and confronts Enforcer Number 10, Blue Blanc, otherwise known as Phantom Thief B. You're the Phantom Thief! The Blanc is a bandit. Who infamously steals people's valuables and puts them through a trial of sorts to test whether they truly value what they lost, and forms a sort of rivalry with Oliver. Using a second gospel, he's been conducting an experiment by creating an orbital projection, which the party speculated was a ghost from before. The purpose behind this will be revealed later. Next in z e i s Estelle reunites with Tita and investigates a series of earthquakes. She finds the source of the quakes and confronts Enforcer Number 8, Walter Kron, also known as the Direwolf. Walter trained under a master of martial arts for years, 
before he killed him with his own hands. Now he's become a member of Ouroboros to test his strength. This is also where, in the anime, this happens. Oh, and I guess Walter is connected to Zinn as well. Yay. Next, in Gransel, Estelle learns that Richard's partner in crime, Kanoe, is still at large, and is attempting to use a gospel integrated into a tank in order to free her superior from prison. Not only that, but an 11 year old girl named Ren got separated from her parents, so Estelle offers to help her. The tank seemed unstoppable at first. However, with a little help from Kevin, they prevent Kanoe from succeeding her goal, and Ren, also known as the Angel of Slaughter, is revealed to have been using her this whole time. Estelle, however, refuses to believe that the time they spent together was fake, and vows to find her. The gang then returns to Roland, where they find out that the town has been covered in a mysterious mist, and upon investigation, Estelle finds yet another gospel in descent to a dream world of sorts. This allows her to re-experience her life as a child and reunites with her deceased mother. <laughs> After a tearful goodbye, she returns to reality and finds out the culprit behind the mist is Enforcer Number 6, Luciola, the Bewitching Bell, who is the childhood friend of Sherazard from her circus days. She's been using this gospel to amplify the Septian Vane's power, resulting in the vast mist around the Roland region. Meanwhile, Weisman and Loe begin their final gospel experiment. Oh yeah, I neglected to mention this earlier, but the masked man from earlier was actually Loe in disguise. They track down the ancient dragon Ragnard, the holy beast of space, and place their final gospel on its head, allowing them to control it. Loe then uses him to terrorize the city of Bose, and has an epic battle with Agat. Ah! <laughs> it's also here where we learn that Agat's little sister was killed during the 100 Days War which is why he forms a connection with Tita. The party eventually confronts Ragnard and defeats him. Thank you! Meanwhile, while Ouroboros terrorizes the land, Joshua has formed an unlikely alliance with Josette and her Sky Bandits and intends to find a way to defeat Ouroboros himself. It's also here where Josette ends up forming a little bit of a crush on Joshua. I'm sure you can imagine Estelle's reaction. Although the alliance doesn't last long, and Joshua leaves them, preferring to be alone. Estelle and the party then infiltrate one of Ouroboros' bases after they found a bracer knocked unconscious. Although Estelle ends up getting captured, and taken to their airship, the Glorious. What are you, freaking Ganondorf? No, 
but he did give me evil piano lessons. Here, Loe then tells Estelle of Joshua and his past, as in everything that went down during Hamel, including that Joshua's older sister, Karen, was killed during the incident, and that he and Loe were the only survivors of the tragedy. Although they are still unaware that there was a third survivor. Now fully understanding the burden Joshua has had his whole life, Estelle is more determined than ever to find him and devises a plan to escape from her cell. <laughs> Although she confronts Mayor Dalmore's steward, Gilbert Stein, of all people, who blocks her path. A masked Jaeger suddenly helps her out, who is revealed to be Joshua. With the two on the surface, Joshua tells Estelle to let him go, terrified of the possibility she could get hurt if she stayed with him. But Estelle says, BULLSHIT! <笑>でも私は守られるだけの存在じゃない。遊撃士を続ける限り、危険から遠ざかってばかりはいられない。ヨシュアがいようがいまいが、その事実は変わらないんだよ。お互いがお互いを守りながら一緒に歩いていこうってこれでもヨシアの背中を守れるくらいには強くなったヨシアがそばにいてくれたらその力は何倍にも大きくなるうっ捨てるうっ<笑><笑><笑> なみだなんて姉さんが死んでから演技でも流せたことないのにそっか見ないであげるからそのまま泣いちゃうといいわ<笑> Meanwhile, Weisman and his five enforcers activate the Gospels they've been experimenting with across the land. The true purpose behind the experiments was to determine whether these artificial Gospels could conduct wishes or miracles. Remember, I said at the beginning of the video that the Gospels were what the ancient people of the city of Liber Ark used to acquire their wishes through the Oreo. However, Celeste Ostlis destroyed all of the Gospels in order to prevent the Oreo from being freed from its prison. That's when Professor Novartis created these artificial copies through his 13 factories. But despite being copies, they had the power of the real thing, and thus the experiments were conducted to determine their authenticity. With the power of the fake Gospels proven, they can finally be put to use to awaken the four towers across the world, which acts as the final barrier that has been keeping the Oreo sealed in another dimension for the past 1000 plus years. Estelle and the party confront each of the enforcers guarding the towers in an attempt to stop them, but they are unsuccessful.
The ancient floating city of Liber Ark has finally returned to our reality. Consequently, a massive blackout happens once again, this time affecting the entirety of Liberal and even other countries outside of it. Estelle and Co. spend the next few hours helping the people in need as they deal with the blackout, including Richard himself, who came to help despite his imprisonment. Meanwhile, Oliver has had his own plans. This is when it's revealed that he is actually a prince from Erebonia, meaning his real name is Oliver Rice Arner, the half-son of the current king of Erebonia, Eugent Rice Arner III. <laughs> Under orders from Chancellor Gilead Osborne himself, he, alongside a squad of military men and tanks from Arabonia, march towards the Burl, who believes that their neighboring country may potentially be issuing an attack. As half of Arabonia was also suffering from the blackout. Suspiciously, the tanks that I brought with them were specifically designed to handle a blackout like this, implying that they were prepared for this. This is because Osborne was tipped off from Wiesman and was intending to accuse Liberal of using the floating city as an attack against Arabonia and is hoping to use that as an excuse to once again attack Liberal and annex the country into Arabonia. I guess you could say Richard's worries were somewhat justified. With that, Princess Claudia confronts Oliver to clear up the situation. Of course, Oliver knows Estelle and Co. are innocent, and is merely playing along with Osborne to hopefully stop his assault. <laughs> they eventually struck a deal that Estelle has to stop the floating city and bring back power to both countries in only a few days. If the party are successful, the Arabonians will cease their attack. With the stakes higher than ever, Estelle, Joshua, and their friends make their way to Liber Ark to stop Wiesman. Along the way, they confront and defeat the enforcers. Chloe and Oliver against Blanc. Hope, 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 hope. Zinn against Walter, Sherazard against Luciona, and Estelle versus Ren. However, in her case, she tries to befriend her. She's just a child after all, and as mentioned before, Estelle refuses to believe that the time they spent together in Gransel was all fake. She's able to reach Ren, sort of, but she runs off crying. Despite this, Estelle is more determined than ever to find her and find her a new home. <sighs> Next, Joshua confronts Loe, who reveals his intentions. He wants to use the Oreo to force humanity to answer their failings. The Hamel incident was covered up by the Arabonian government officially stating that it was destroyed by a landslide, and everyone in the Empire forgot it even existed. Frustrated by this, Loe believes that people should face their sins head-on, instead of running away from them, and he intends to force their ugly truths upon them. However, Joshua believes that humans aren't that weak, and they can fight against even the vilest of tragedies, without using the Oreo. Joshua himself is proof of this. They have an epic battle, and the Black Fang ends up being the victor. <laughs> With Loe conceding, <gasps> oh, 
よかった本当によかったレイブがレイブが戻ってきてくれたあおいヘヴンデンレヴィールソムインテリスティングインフォメーション That Loe in the past had fought against a woman named Rufina Argent, who had ties with the Septarian Church and was a sister slash mother of sorts to Kevin. She's also long since passed away. Regardless, this will be important in a later game. Future Bobby here. A quick note for the uninformed. This scene between Kevin and Loe. Can only be viewed if you had Kevin in your party. And unfortunately, easily missable scenes like this is a common reoccurrence throughout this series. As to why Falcom keeps doing this, I have no idea, <laughs> but it's really dumb if you ask me. But keep in mind that I will try to mention most of these scenes throughout this video, at least the ones that I deem the most significant. And I'll even put a message box in one of the four corners to let you know when and where you can find one of these scenes. But either way, that's all I wanted to say. So take it away, past Bobby. With the Blade Lord defeated, Weesman decides to take the matter into his own hands and brainwashes Joshua by taking control of his stigma. <laughs> Weissman reveals that he believes humanity needs the Oreo to properly function. Using it, he will create a perfect paradise where everyone can be happy. Of course, Estelle disagrees with this, as the human race has already proven they are fine by themselves, as shown by how everyone on the surface is working together to deal with the power outage. Basically, Once again, Estelle has the power of friendship on her side, and Weesman has no friends. If you believe in the power of people, then you need to think about it. That's why 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 you need to think about it. Weesman then sends Joshua to attack her. And orders him to kill her. Then he's going to take off his mind control and make him see Estelle's corpse to ensure that he'll never disobey his master again. Erin, that's a little fucked up, no? Before Joshua deals the final blow, however, he snaps out of it and was only pretending to be mind controlled. This is because Kevin had actually examined Joshua's stigma earlier. And removed Weesman's hold over it, as he had a feeling that the faceless might pull a stunt like this. As to how Kevin was able to pull this off, I'll explain that later. Cornered, Weesman uses the full might of the Oreo and transforms into a biblically accurate depiction of an angel. Oh my god! Loe then appears out of nowhere. And accuses Weisman of having an involvement in the Hamel incident. He confirms his suspicion, and it's revealed that while Colonel Arendelle and his nobles were the ones that ordered the attack, Weisman was the one that gave them the idea in the first place. All that was left. Was a certain curse to incentivize them even further. Loe then breaks through Weisman's barrier using the sword Kernhitter that the Grandmaster gave him, but it backfires, causing an explosion, fatally injuring the Blade Lord. Estelle and Co are able to defeat Weisman, but he loses the Oreo. Albeit, he does escape to see the day, and Loe is able to give his last words to Joshua. <laughs> Meanwhile, Weisman is trying to make his exit. Before he's able to escape the city altogether, however, Kevin appears out of nowhere. 
and shoots a certain object directly into Weisman's chest. It doesn't do anything at first, so Weisman laughs it off, before realizing that his body was dissolving. The arrow Kevin shot was part of the salt pail from North Ambria, and his true mission all along was to assassinate Weisman. Ironic that the very thing that claimed his own parents also took his own life. Meanwhile, with the Oreo now missing, Estelle and Joshua run as the city of Liber Ark falls apart. They are trapped, however, and with nowhere to run, they have no choice but to fall to their deaths. The End Nah, I'm just messing with you. Cassia saved them. The pair place Loe's sword on a grave in Hamel, and they continue their lives as bracers, hand in hand. Cry for me. Before we continue on to Trails in the Sky the third, we need to talk about the door episodes. In this game, it introduces a mechanic where you can play through multiple episodes focusing on the main characters, which take place during multiple different moments on the timeline before the events of its main story. Such as a flashback where you get to play as a young Sherizard, showing what Richard is up to post Sky second chapter, in ones that even focus on some of the side characters slash NPCs. I've already covered a few, such as the Salt Pill incident and the infamous Paradise. However, there are still a few I need to mention. Immediately after Weisman's death, Kepanella Enforcer Number Zero has an audience with the remaining Anguises and gives the Oreo to the Grandmaster. As to what Ouroboros intends to use it for, that is currently unknown. However, it's here where the Grandmaster announces the Society's second phase, the Phantasmal Blaze Plan. Before the events of Sky First Chapter, Chloe, or Claudia, begins her first day at Genus Academy where she meets the class president at the time, Lecter Arendelle. あの、私もう寮に戻らないと。この見える。失礼します。そっちは男子寮。Even with his position, however, he tends to run off to avoid his duties, leaving to his classmates to find him in a game of hide-and-seek, and often goops around. Despite this, Lecter does help Chloe with her troubles, and they end up becoming friends. Then suddenly, he disappears, much like his past attempts to force his classmates to find him. This time, however, no one could locate him, and he never returned. Three years later, not long after the events of Sky's second chapter, Oliver was quietly visiting the castle of Gransel alongside his partner, Melior Vander, the descendant of Roland Vander from the era of the War of the Lions. That is until they received an unexpected guest, Chancellor Osborne himself.
お初にお目にかかりますエレボニア帝国政府代表ギリアス・オズボーンと申しますこのような形での突然の訪問どうかお許しいただきたいオズボーン tells オリバート of the four great houses power over the country of エレボニア and that he only controls 70% of the military, while they control the remaining 30%. He asks Olivert to help him crush the nobility, so that he can take that remaining 30% for himself. Olivert obviously refuses, and expresses his concern over Osborne's actions. And upon his airship, Olivert shows his resolve into defeating the Chancellor. And it wouldn't be long after this when Alvert would gather up a group of heroes in order to help him defeat the Chancellor. And it's also revealed during the store that Lecter was actually an Erebonian spy. Despite this, Lecter is proud of the woman Chloe has become and is relieved to reunite with her childhood friend. Or potential love interest, depending how you look at it. One of the kids from the orphanage in Ruan, a girl named Mary, tries to find an object known as a happiness stone, so she can give it as a birthday present for the matron. In her search, she comes across a baby dragon, the child of Ragnard. They become friends, and eventually Mary finds a happiness stone in her pocket when she returns home, just in time for matron's birthday. At first glance, this may not seem all that important for the grander narrative. However, Kondo, the director of the series, did confirm in an interview in 2019 that this episode will be important for the end of the series, and that it somehow has ties with the mysteries of the franchise. As to what exactly that means, we have no idea yet, but it's important to note. The story begins with Kevin boarding a Rhineford airship to steal back an illegal artifact. I neglected to mention this during the Sky Second Chapter section of this video, but Kevin is one of the 12 Dominions of the Grosritter, specifically its 5th Dominion. It's also here where a recurring character named Professor Nielsen makes his first appearance. After Kevin is successfully able to acquire the artifact. Oh god, bad idea, 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 bad idea. He reunites with his childhood friend, Reese Argent. Also the second best trails girl fight me. She's been assigned as Kevin's squire, who often accompany most dominions within the church. Although she isn't exactly happy to see Kevin as he abandoned her five years ago, after Rufina, her older sister, passed away. After sort of clearing up their differences, they have a confrontation with a mysterious masked man, who tells them he is a servant of someone who he calls the Lord of Phantasma. He then transports them to another dimension, going by the same name. Kevin and Reese explore Phantasma, which created copies of existing locations, such as the Castle of Gransel and the Lock. They also reunite with old friends like Chloe, Estelle, Oliver, etc., who made their way to the dimension. Not only that, but the enemies they face are different from the monsters they fought in their world, that being demons directly from hell. <laughs> There is a reason for this that will be explained later. Throughout the adventure, we are shown flashbacks of Kevin's past, showing us his life when he was still living with Rufina and Reese. 
お仕事に慣れてきたら少しは余裕もできると思うけどたくだったらなおさら今のうちに休んどけばいいやん今からでも朝飯まで寝といた方がええんとちゃうかケビン冷たいえお姉ちゃんが最後のひとときを一緒に過ごそうとしているのに邪魔者扱いするだなんて<笑>育て方を間違えちゃったかしらじゃ邪魔なんて一言も言うてへんやろそれに世話にはなったけど育てられた覚えはないしケビン素直じゃない本当は姉様と話せて嬉しいくせに<笑>あらあら本当そっか<笑>男の子だもんねつい They eventually confront the Lord of Phantasma who seems to have some kind of vendetta against Kevin This is the part where you spout some mumbo jumbo and disappear right? Screw you creepo After Kevin has a moment of being Kevin Reese gets angry at him for his recent behavior. While we, the audience, doesn't know this yet, it's important to note that the Kevin we see is different from the Kevin Reese knew as a child. He used to be someone who was open with his feelings, while now he betrays himself as this goofy, kind of eccentric type of person, almost like he's trying to mask his real personality. <laughs> でも違ったケビンはあそこにいる誰に対しても気を許したりはしていない心が冷めきっているのに表面だけ調子を合わせてるだけ感情を完璧にコントロールして気さくな人間のふりをしてるだけしばらく見ててやっと分かった<笑>そりゃまた妙な心配をされたもんやな悪いけど。俺はそこまで器用やあらへんで嬉しい時は嬉しいし怒りだってそう抑えられへんもういいえっ、oh, so、<笑>あっいい加減にして<笑> Joshua appears and we learn about Kevin's role as a Dominion He goes by the nickname Heretic Hunter, named after his job, which is to track down the church's most wanted enemies and execute them. Weisman was his latest target. It's even revealed that Kevin knew Estelle was going to get kidnapped by Ouroboros ahead of time and used her as bait to get to Weisman. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying?、Mm, oh my god, stop fucking lying! Despite this, Joshua is grateful for Kevin helping him withstand w e e s p i n s mind control in the previous game. Not long after, a powerful demon appears and almost wipes Reese and the others out. That is until Kevin unleashed his stigma. Akuma, I can eat my saragado. Aratomate Kisamo gave what on intense. Inorimo Kaigo Mohatasen Mama. Send no togeo motte sonomini zetbo kizami. Siritona te mumio no yamini kierugai. Using it, he completely annihilates the demon. Although at the cost of falling unconscious immediately afterwards. Remember that, excluding Joshua, these stigmas are unique to the Dominions. However, unlike Joshua, Kevin's stigma is extremely powerful. So much that it can put a toll on its user. With our favorite food girl Reese now temporarily acting as the protagonist of this game, a ghost has been appearing again and again throughout the adventure, 
and is finally able to properly communicate with the party. It is revealed to be Celeste Ostlis, the ancient founder of the Kingdom of the Burrow, or at the very least, an AI copy of her that she created before she passed away. And she reveals the true nature of Phantasma. This world was created by the Oreo to act as an additional space where people who desired for certain wishes could live. Or to put it more simply, in Celeste's own terms, Phantasma is like a fictional world in order to fulfill humanity's every wish and desire. This is why certain locations we've explored are familiar, as they stem from the memories and thoughts of our main cast. Remember this detail because it will become important later. After a long boss rush of familiar allies and enemies that were created by Phantasma, Kevin and the others finally confront the masked man Schwarzberger, who is revealed to be Loe. He may not be the real Loe, but this at least gives Joshua an opportunity to say a proper goodbye to his childhood friend. Sayonara, Rebe. <sighs> Next, the party arrives at Kevin and Reese's childhood orphanage, Ulster House, at least an artificial copy of it. The duo reminisces about their days as kids, and this finally gives Kevin the courage to tell everyone the truth about what happened to Rafina and what happened in his past before he met Reese. To the viewers out there, this is a massive trigger warning, because what happens next is extremely dark. You have been warned. Before he met Reese and Rafina, more than 15 years ago, Kevin was living with his mother, who was very frail and weak. Even so, they lived happily together, despite her weak heart. Before one day, out of nowhere, she began strangling Kevin to death. This was because she had enough of living and was trying to take her son with her. But Kevin was able to escape and run off. When he returned home, he found that she had killed herself. Likely because she was ashamed of what she attempted to do. And you know what? It gets worse! Five years ago, when Kevin was 17, he was ordered to help fend off against a group of Jaegers who attacked Ulster House. Before he knew it, however, one of the Jaegers had taken Reese hostage and grabbed an artifact which was being kept within an underground passage within the orphanage, known as the Spear of Loa. With it, the Jaeger was able to transform into a monster. That was when Kevin first awakened to his stigma. Using it, he killed the Jaeger, but then went into an uncontrollable frenzy. Consumed by his stigma, Rufina appeared out of nowhere and used herself as a shield to protect Reese. And the result would scar Kevin for life. まあ、そういうことや。この俺が you are dead! Not a big surprise! This is when the Lord of Phantasma appears and takes off his, or rather her, mask. 
revealing the face of Rafina Argent. But wait, isn't she dead? My death was greatly exaggerated. To clarify, no, this isn't the real Rafina. It is, in fact, much darker than you think. Remember, Phantasma is a world that was created to deliver humans' desires. Which then begs the question, what does Kevin desire? The answer is simple, to die. Ever since what happened to Rafina, he's been blaming himself for her death, and to a smaller extent, his mother, even though it wasn't his fault. And once Kevin and Reese touched the recluse cube, which granted them access to Phantasma in the first place, that's when the Lord of Phantasma, or rather, the desires of Kevin, came into existence. And the devils and demons that the party have been fighting all this time, along with it. To help put things into perspective, Kevin's situation is just like Futaba from Persona 5, but far, far worse. Kill yourself! Not only that, but Kevin's role as the heretic hunter was actually him intentionally trying to punish himself. You know, I really think Kevin should get a therapist. Their goal is simple. To drag Kevin into an eternal hell. To make him suffer for the crimes he's committed. With that, the Lord of Phantasma decides to send Reese to hell as well. Believing that making Kevin's loved ones suffer is a part of his punishment. But he dives in after her as he doesn't want her getting dragged into this. Oh god, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Kono aho! They try to find a way to escape hell, but they face off against the ghosts of the many people Kevin has assassinated over the years. First, the man who sent the Jaegers to attack Ulster House. Next, his own mother. And even a three-year-old child that was brainwashed into becoming a cannibal by the DG cult. Hey yo, what the fuck? They then arrive at their final opponent who just so happens to be Kevin's most recent victim, Gorg Wiesman. Back from the dead assholes. We're in hell, so you're technically still dead. Shut up. Don't like that burn? Oh, that's right, because you're burning in hell. <laughs> he offers Kevin a deal to become his next super weapon. Joshua, of course, has escaped his grasp, so Kevin becoming his new personal assassin would be the next best thing. Better yet, Kevin would become an emotionless puppet, fulfilling his desire to essentially die. Killing two birds with one stone. However, Kevin surprisingly refuses, as he remembers the first time he and Rafina met giving him the strength to continue forward. He decides that his life is now worth living. Then the rest of the party arrive just in time, and they escape from hell. Kevin's decision now means he needs to defeat the Lord of Phantasma rather than accept his punishment. So, with a little help from Gilbert of all people, who made his way into Phantasma, they head to Castle Phantasmagoria for the final battle. Now it's time I show you my true form. Your life literally is as valuable as a summer ant. I'm just gonna stump you. You're gonna keep coming back. I'm gonna seal up all my cracks. You're gonna keep coming back. Why? Because you keep smelling the syrup, you worthless bitch ass nigga. You're gonna stay on my dick until you die. You serve no purpose in life. Your purpose in life is to be in my stream sucking on my dick daily. Your life is nothing. 
You serve zero purpose. You should kill yourself now and give somebody else a piece of that oxygen in an ozone layer that's covered up so that we can breathe inside this blue trap bubble. Kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. Because what are you here for? To worship me? Kill yourself. Hey, my suicidal thoughts, how about you kill yourself instead? Okay, ouch. After the Lord is defeated, Rafina makes one final appearance, and to destroy it once and for all, Kevin has to kill her once again. This time, Reese decides to do it alongside him, and they pull the trigger together. Rufina <laughs> Everyone then all goes their separate ways, including Ren who had gotten involved in this mess as well. So Estelle and Joshua yet again run after her to find her. And Kevin, now returning to the base of the Grosswitter, is now living his life to the fullest and decides to change his title from Heretic Hunter to the Thousand Hand Guardian. Okay, but seriously, he should really get a therapist. With Ren now on the run, she's decided that she wants to accomplish two things. First, is to find out why her parents abandoned her. And the second is to find a certain individual and bring them to justice. While it is true that the DG cult was completely wiped out by Guy Bannings and his crew, what they didn't realize was that there was at least one survivor. And that survivor is out there hiding somewhere. But before we continue on to Trails from Zero, we need to take a quick detour. As shown in the manga, The Ring of Judgment, Estelle and Joshua go on a small-scale journey to Erebonia. Under orders from Elm Selnate, the first dominion of the Grosritter, and its Grandmaster, they team up with a bracer named Tovel Rodenaire. Their mission is to defeat a Jaeger group known as Jester, who have stolen an illegal artifact, a ring capable of possessing its user. And the trio soon find out that the Jaegers got possessed by the ring, with their souls being completely erased. During their mission, they meet two kids named Tilia and Kai in a small town named Ulster, but Kai ends up getting possessed by the ring as well. They eventually save Kai and free the Jaegers from the ring's control, and Elm Selnate appears to confiscate the artifact. Before she takes it, however, Estelle and Joshua ask her where Ren's current location is. She's curious as to why they would want to know the location of the 15th Enforcer of Ouroboros who's committed countless atrocities under their orders. But Estelle doesn't care, and wants nothing more for Ren to be a part of the Bright family. Elm Cell Knight eventually gives in and tells them Ren's current location. Crossfell, the City of Sin. The story begins with a flash forward. A brown-haired young man and his subordinates are shown running in what has appeared to be one of the DG Cult's bases, as they apprehend a certain suspect. Normally, I wouldn't bring this up yet, as timeline-wise, this moment happens much later. However, there is a reason why I am mentioning this right now. 
which I'll get into later in the video. The story then flashes back five months in the past, with the brown-haired boy named Lloyd Bannings on for his first assignment as a police officer, who by the way, is Guy Banning's little brother. He joins a special task force known as the SSS, or Special Support Section. He meets his co-workers, Ellie McDowell, the daughter of the mayor of Crossbell, Tio Plato, a 14-year-old genius who has ties with the Upstein Foundation, and Randy Orlando, the horny guy. Randy the horny guy. Randy. Randy, 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 titties rule. Randy, Did I mention I like thighs and ass too? Randy, the horny guy. For the past decade or so, the Bracer Guild has been known for helping citizens and is more popular than ever in Crossbell. They help people in need more often, to the point where, in the eyes of the public, the police force now feels useless by comparison. In order to regain its reputation, the SSS was then created for one specific purpose, to mimic the Bracer Guild's policies. For Lloyd's first assignment, together they must save a child who ran into the Geofront, an underground facility existing within the city. The boy was about to get attacked by a monster, however. That is until a Bracer named Arios McLean saves him. Having to rely on a bracer to do the job for them, the SSS is treated as a joke. But they have another chance to improve their reputation. Two gangs in the back streets are in a feud. Their leaders, Wazi Hemisphere and Wald, who's a character that exists, are accusing each other of starting a war. A member of Wazi's gang was attacked and sent to the hospital, and he's accusing Wald's men of committing the deed. After getting information from a reporter, oh God, no! and a lawyer named Ian Grimwood, or Adam Some Call Me Johnny. Lloyd then tracks down the real corporate behind the incident, and what he finds is a group of men in black. Before he's able to arrest them, however, he soon realizes that they are members of the local mafia, Ravish. Led by Don Marconi, Ravish has been knee deep in Crossbell's criminal underworld for more than multiple decades being backed by a powerful government official. Because of this, the police have no choice but to look the other way from their criminal activities. With that, Lloyd is unfortunately forced to let them go. Now the name, the City of Sin, is starting to make a lot more sense. Even so, Lloyd is determined to overcome these barriers that has been laid out before him. For the next few months, the SSS are busy fulfilling requests for the citizens of Crossbell, and said requests lead them to a plethora of significant characters, such as Harold Hayworth, a businessman donning a familiar set of pink hair, Guy's fiance, Cecile News, who is a caretaker of sorts for Lloyd. I'm not jealous. And even Estelle and Joshua Bright, who are still searching for Ren. And after a case involving Ravish once again, they come across the holy beast of Mirage, Zet, who offers them his aid, and even gets adopted into the family. Aww. 
The next assignment for the SSS leads them to a performer named Rixia Mao. Dender clear it! The apprentice to Ilya Plater, Crossbell's most famous dancer. She informs them that Ilya got a death threat message from an assassin by the name of Yin, who has ties with one of the local mafia groups in the city. They first confront Garcia Rossi of Ravish, Marconi's right-hand man, but he denies all involvement. <laughs> Garcia also seems to recognize the color of Randy's hair. Hmm. Next is the other mafia group known as Heyu. Lloyd confronts their leader, my favorite scumbag, Cao Lee, but he also denies all involvement. But despite his claims, it's revealed behind the scenes that he does have contact with the infamous assassin. However, with the help of Dieter Kreuz and his daughter Maribel of the IBC, Lloyd tracks down the assassin and they reveal that Yin did not send the letter, but rather it was a copycat. To draw out the real corporate, the SSS act as bodyguards for Rixia and Ilya's next performance, and they find out who sent the letter. Mayor McDowell's secretary, Ernest Rice, who is also Ellie's caretaker. And the death threat towards Ilya was actually a distraction, as his real goal all along was to assassinate the mayor so that he could replace him. Lloyd and the others are thankfully able to prevent the assassination, but when they chase Ernest, he seems to have some kind of supernatural strength. Hmm. Even so, with the help of Zet, they are all able to successfully arrest him. Meanwhile, Yin the Assassin is seen climbing the rooftops and takes off his, or rather her, mask, revealing Rixia Mao. What a twist! A month later, Mayor McDowell holds a festival celebrating Crossbell's 70 years of existing, which leads to a bunch of nice bonding scenes between the SSS. However, they are unable to participate, as the SSS are yet again required to do a bunch of police requests. Oh! But I wanted to go to the strip club. First, they meet a medical doctor named Joisham Guenter who has a habit of fishing during his shifts. Next, they prevent yet another fight between Wazi and Wald. And then, they had to track down an infamous hacker named Kitty, who the SSS finds out is actually Ren. Enduring yet another request, where they help locate Harold Harewarf's son, who went missing, Ren gets to meet the boy who replaced her. With the boy now safe, the Hayworth family reveals their story, with Ren hiding in a closet. They mention that they had temporarily left their daughter Rennie at a friend's house because they were in severe debt. 
But when they returned after their debts were cleared, the home of their acquaintance was burned, leaving no survivors. Believing their daughter was dead, they were considering suicide, but that's when Harold's wife realized she was pregnant, and they decided to continue living because of their new child. Having revealing their situation, they thank the SSS for saving their son, and they leave their room, still unaware of their daughter present in the closet. Analyzing some data that the SSS got a hold of from Ren's hacking, they learned a ton of information such as the government official that's been backing Ravish this whole time, is named Speaker Hartman. It's also revealed that Garcia was originally a member of Zephyr, a massive Jaeger group. Although not just any other Jaeger group, but one of the most powerful ones on the continent. Only rivaling the Red Constellation, which is also quite infamous among Jaegers. But more about them later. Because the last piece of info reveals that Ravish is soon holding a secret auction where they sell tons of illegal goods. The SSS infiltrate the auction in the hopes of demolishing their business, and even dress up for the occasion. Hey, girl with the big tits. Coincidentally, Lecter Arundel, a woman named Kilika Rulin, and even Maribel Kreuz are both present at the auction for reasons that will be unveiled later. Within the building, Lloyd finds a briefcase and opens it, only to find a girl with green hair named Kia inside. But it's here where he's found out, so the SSS, alongside the girl, rush to escape. Lloyd hopes to accuse Ravish of human trafficking in order to take him down. However, they deny all involvement with Kia being inside the briefcase, as Marconi has no idea how she got there. Regardless, the SSS have the girl to worry about, and they try to find her parents. But unfortunately, she has amnesia, so Lloyd reunites with Dr. Guenter and they ask him to repair the girl's memories. But she refuses to get tested by the doctor and runs off, and ends up befriending Arios' daughter, Shizuku McLean. So Lloyd decides to give in to her demands and let her stay at the SSS building for the time being. Meanwhile, Ravish's partnership with Speaker Hartman has gone downhill, as he's starting to question their usefulness after the auction was so easily infiltrated by a small police task force. In a desperate attempt to regain his trust, Marconi calls on the help of a certain someone. A month later, Alongside Noel Seeker, a military officer from the Crossbell Army, the SSS are tasked to investigate an abandoned temple where ghosts were supposedly sighted, and Tio seems to recognize the temple. But what they find inside is a demon directly from hell. They defeat it, and find out the bell at the top of the tower is what's causing the ghosts and demons to appear, so they stop it from ringing. Interestingly, the bell is similar to the one in Crossbell Plaza. Hmm. Despite a crazy night, the SSS have yet another strange case to solve. 
A miner from a nearby village seems to be going off the deep end, winning games at poker consistently and becoming more and more cocky. But when he loses a game to Lecter, he gets extremely agitated and attempts to start a fight. Lloyd prevents the miner from committing any damage, and he notices he has supernatural strength. Not only that, but he also finds a bottle of azure-colored drugs in his pocket. <laughs> the SSS then track down Dr. Guenter once again to ask him if he knows what the drugs are. And through his research, he reveals that it goes by the name Gnosis. That single word causes Tio to have a panic attack. She then reveals to her allies that years ago, she was a victim of the DG cult. Gnosis was a drug created from the souls of the children they sacrificed. Its purpose is to enhance a human's senses and strength, and makes them unhinged, turning them into a completely different person. And Tio was the only child of those sacrifices that survived. With the truth of Gnosis revealed, Chief Sir Guy mentions how its existence points to the possibility that there is a DT cult survivor. The next day, multiple people from across the city have been reported to have gone missing including Ravish, where upon investigation of their base alongside Detective Dudley, the SSS finds no one to be seen, except evidence of Ravish's involvement with the cult. The SSS attempt to head back to Dr. Guenter to ask him about the testing of Gnosis, but the buses are down. Dudley then informs them that Guenter was Ernest's doctor before his assassination attempt on the mayor. Wait a minute! Now that I think about it, Ernest was just like that miner from before. He was extremely cocky and had supernatural strength. And if Guenter was his doctor and knew about Gnosis' existence, I motherfuck. The SSS heads straight to the hospital, only to find members of Ravish and even Ernest consumed by Gnosis. And there, they find the proof they were looking for. That Guenter really is the survivor of the DG cult. They find pictures of the children the cult sacrificed, as well as Ren and Tio, and even evidence that Speaker Hartman was apparently a frequent customer of Paradise. And Dr. Guenter has been using that information to blackmail him. They said there were 18! That's the truth! Who the fuck is 18 in the 7th grade? See you in court! In other words, Guenter all along has had Ravish through Speaker Hartman in the palm of his hand this whole time. Lastly, they also find pictures of Kia as well, so Lloyd not letting her stay here was definitely a good call. Back at the SSS HQ, suddenly the crossbow police and military barges in and attacks. Guenter, using Hartman, had forced him to give the entire military the Gnosis drug, so Crossbell's army is now completely under his control. So Lloyd are forced to the IBC, where Dieter and Maribel Kreuss offer them shelter. 
There, Lloyd has some bonding opportunities with his allies, and Randy reveals in his scene that he was originally a member of the Red Constellation, the Jaeger group I mentioned before. And after leaving Kia and the Kors family's care, the SSS, alongside Estelle and Joshua, heads straight to the cult base where Guenter is located, leading up to the flash forward at the beginning of the game. Note, however, that Estelle and Joshua was not present in the previous scene. Hmm. Anyway, did I mention how good the song is? Ravish members, Ernest, and even Garcia are there, who, by taking a red version of the Gnosis drug, transformed into demons. After defeating them, the SSS finally confront Guenter, the mastermind. He demands the group to offer him Kia, his goddess. He reveals that Kia is actually hundreds of years old, and for all that time, she was sleeping in the cradle in that very room, when suddenly one day, she was stolen from him, and he wants his goddess back. Lloyd obviously refuses and fights back to protect Kia, before Guenter takes multiple red versions of Gnosis and transforms into a massive demon. But with the help of Ren, they are able to defeat him. Before Ren gets to run off once again, Estelle catches her. もう逃がしてあげないんだから。これからどこでどんな風に暮らしていくか一緒に考える必要はあるけど、まずは一度リベールに帰りましょう。ティータもずっと連のことを待っているわ。ね。With <笑> that. Kia is now safe from the cult, and the SSS head home, deciding to raise her as their own. The public and even the Racer Guild recognize their efforts, and it's here where they finally earn Arios' respect. Meanwhile, Dieter Kreuz has been elected as the new mayor of Crossbell, with Ellie's grandfather stepping down. Of course, the story doesn't end here. But before we continue on to Trails to Azure, we need to go back in time a few months in the Empire of Erebonia. That is, in the next video. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I really underestimated how long this video was going to be. <laughs> it's uh, almost three hours long right now, so it's best if I split this into two parts. But don't worry, I'll get part two out eventually. So I'll see you in the next video. Anyway, in Trails We Trust! <laughs>